so on the stage with me here today are two of those people. I'm really excited about this conversation to take on one of the big challenges of our day, and that is the lack of competitive, fair markets for farmers and, and the difficulty of increasing monopolization that squeezes farmers on both ends. And I think we'll even go beyond that to talk about how people other than farmers are affected by these very same trends in our overall economy. So um, I'll begin with short introductions. Uh, first, Roger Johnson. Roger Johnson is the president of National Farmers Union, a position he has held since 2009. He, in that capacity, represents all of us and um, members like us all over the country, thousands of farmers who are working um, for their own family farms, but also coming together to advocate for um, better um, policies and um, local economies um, for agriculture. Um, he has a background in economics, and that is so valuable to this conversation that we're having about consolidation and antitrust. Um, with us also is Austin Frerich, who is a research fellow at the Open Markets Institute. And the Open Markets Institute is a team of journalists, researchers, lawyers, and advocates working together to examine extreme concentrations of economic and political power. Very um, well placed, and um, all of you Badgers will be happy to know that Austin also has a graduate degree from the University of Wisconsin. Woo! Um, I, I have asked both of them to begin by sharing with us a, a snapshot of where we are in our economy today. And so I'm um, going to start with Roger, and um, I know he has a couple of slides, so let me just step away and take a look. Slides. Yeah. Is this thing working? Can you hear me in the back? All right, I see a thumb way in the back. Oh, there's Chief Counsel Velvet way in the back. The guy in the gray hair and the ponytail and the red top. Yeah. You'll be seeing him later. He's in charge. Okay, have we got it up now? No? Momentarily. All right, so while, while we're bringing the slides up, they're up. All right. So go to the next one. Just turn the lights there. off. Now turn the lights off. <laughs> We're down. Okay, so the, 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 this is just a really quick few pictures before we even introduce ourselves and start talking about the issue. And it's sort of to set the stage looking at, uh, at this industry of agriculture. CR4 is a, is a measurement that is used uh, by uh, economists and social scientists to look at the concentration of uh, power in the marketplace. And it's measured by the number of firms as a percentage of the whole. So CR4 means concentration ratio of the top four firms uh, or companies in the industry. So the way to read this is the first one on the left, beef, says that the top four firms, the four largest companies in the beef processing sector control 85% of the market. Okay, that's how you read this slide. Uh, just so happens that two of the top four are also foreign owned, but that's a different story. Uh, so, and the, and the rule of thumb is that if that number, if that percentage is over 40, in some cases 50%, you've got a non-competitive marketplace. So, beef is double or a lot of beef. It's a not a competitive marketplace. Pork, over the mark. Poultry, over the mark. Corn seed. Soybean seeds, potash, fertilizer, 100%, there's only two. So uh, it's a, we have an enormously concentrated, read, non-competitive market uh, on, the, uh, on the input side as well as the marketing side of agriculture. This just looks at what's happened since the 1970s of the seed industry. 
Now all those little blue circles are different seed companies that existed back in the 70s. And the center of them, the red ones, are who owns them today. So for example, uh, Bayer has sucked up all those folks around it, okay? Uh, the next largest one, Corteva, which is the spin-off of the Dow uh, DuPont merger that just happened, okay? So that's what's happened uh, in that industry. Lots of concentration. Oops, why is it there's advancing? Do you want to point it that way? Point it towards the podium. Yeah. Oh. Nice. That's counterintuitive. <laughs> <laughs> it also doesn't work. Yeah. So, who's got the computer? Just I only have two more of these. So. Okay. Roger, am I reading this right? That that's just since 1996. So, uh, yeah, you're actually right. It is since 1996. Our narrative went back into the 80s. Okay. So this is. Same information that was shown in the first slide, but in more detail. Okay, now, next slide. Uh, and that's sort of the ones that have been in the news the last couple of years. These are the three big uh, mega mergers. Uh, Dow DuPont up in the upper right hand corner gives you the, the size of that company. Uh, over there is the Bayer Monsanto. That was, Bayer was the largest in the world. Monsanto, third largest. Uh, and then it's uh, the one that you can't read that's Chinese. That's the Chem China Syngenta merger. So those are the three big ones that have taken place. And a lot of folks think of that as being about seed. Other folks think about it as being about chemicals. The fact of the matter is, it's about both. And that another way to be thinking about this is the seed and chemical industry has virtually become one because most of many of the chemicals now that are used are used as uh, compounds used on the top of seeds that have traits unique to that chemical. You all know how that works. And so that's another degree of concentration that results in us like getting less competition. The final point I make here, as a result of this series of mergers, we really have in the seed and chemical space an effective duopoly. You know what a monopoly is? It's one firm. A duopoly is two firms. You have the, uh, the Dow DuPont and the, uh, the Bayer uh, as being the two companies that effectively serve as that duopoly. Uh, and everyone else has to kind of find their space in that marketplace. So that's what I wanted to do in terms of sort of setting the stage and talking about where we're at. Can we actually go back to that first slide on the oh, ratios? Good luck. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> oh. Ah, there we go. Let's talk about this because these numbers are incredibly hard to find and that's intentional. These numbers, the, U, the FTC used to publish these numbers, but they were killed under President Ronald Reagan, under intense lobbying by Chamber of Commerce. You cannot gauge what you cannot measure. And so that's just a big part of this too, is let's put good numbers out there so we can start this conversation. So what that numbers mean, for A, for workers, talk about slaughterhouses. The average hormone worker in like Austin, Minnesota made 1069 in 1985. Last year, they made $3 more. That's not adjusting for inflation. The CEO of Smithfield, I wrote this down because I can't, this number always blows my mind, 291 million last year. That's what happens with those numbers. The average farmer in the 80s was at 85, got 37 cents on the dollar. Now you get 15. That's what those numbers mean. You, the power is concentrated in these hands, and also we should also talk about the fact that most of them are foreign known. GBS wasn't even in this country 10 years ago, and now they're the largest meat monopoly here. Um, I think it's a national security issue at this point. Um, and I'd like to, both of you to talk about the 
um, implications of consolidation of monopolies beyond price. So that's a great yeah. lead into that. Um, we, a lot of times we think about farmers being squeezed in terms of their prices between suppliers and buyers, but what about the other non-price implications? Well, so here are the, the, the essence of a non-competitive marketplace that results from this kind of concentration in the marketplace is, first of all, you have a pricing effect. So for the company, or the companies that are in this industry, they're able to charge a higher price than they otherwise would be able to charge if the, if the marketplace was competitive. If they had a whole bunch of other firms competing for that business, uh, the equilibrium point at which they're gonna sell their products to a farmer for is at a higher level for a, a non-competitive marketplace than it is for a competitive marketplace. So you get to pay more for your inputs. The second thing you see is that you're on the output side, the price that you get for what you have to sell if it's going into a concentrated marketplace of very few buyers, they are able to squash that pay price down more than they would be able to if it were competitive, okay? So you, hurt, you, you lose on the cost side and on the price side. Another impact is choice. You end up with fewer choices of either products, either places to sell stuff to, or types of inputs that you're gonna buy from, you end up with less choice. And the one that long-term I think does us enormous damage is you generally end up with less innovation. So a competitive marketplace is gonna, is gonna involve a lot more people being out there spinning new ideas, trying new things, uh, some of which works, much of which doesn't, doesn't matter. A competitive marketplace is gonna let all those ideas bubble around and bubble to the surface. A non-competitive marketplace uh, is one where the large companies that control the marketplace tend to spend more of their time and resources protecting the market as opposed to being more innovative in that space. Roger, you had an example about canola. I did. Uh, so, <laughs> this. We're doing some of this backwards because we're supposed to like introduce ourselves. So this is a chance to introduce myself. Yeah. So I uh, spent most of my life as a farmer in North Dakota. I grew up at Farmers Union. Uh, I went to NDSU and graduated with a degree in agricultural economics and did uh, graduate work there in the same field. Uh, I came back and started farming in the late 70s. Uh, you probably know that following the 70s or the 80s. <laughs> Economists know these things. Okay? <laughs> these were a tough time for agriculture, not unlike a lot of the, the trouble that we're experiencing today. Um, and so I farmed during that time. Um, and one of the things that as the years went on, we saw our cropping patterns change. North Dakota has now become the number one canola producer in the country. Uh, I don't want to brag about how North Dakota is number one in all these things because I don't want to make you guys feel bad. But <laughs> one, one of the things that you learn as a canola farmer in North Dakota is it's important to have choice of different seed types, right? Uh, if you look, and we did this research when the Dow DuPont merger was pending, so a couple years ago now, uh, we looked at how many canola types of seed could I buy for my farm in Turtle Lake, North Dakota. One of the companies had four varieties or types, and I'll describe that in a second. The other one had seven, okay? Seven and four, 11 choices. Now, when the companies merge, how many of you think we're gonna end up with more choices? More likely, fewer choices. The problem is 11 is too few choices to begin with because a choice can be a variety. It can be that same variety with a trait added or the same variety with two traits added or the same variety with the other trait other than the first one added. I've already got four and it's only one variety. 
Okay? So you get the point. We have heavy soil. We have sandy soil. You really need different varieties of different types of soil. We have early springs and we have late springs. You need different varieties with different growing season lengths uh, for those different circumstances. I mean, you get the point. There aren't enough choices today and we're likely gonna see fewer choices as a result of this concentration. So that's the, that's the example that I actually spent a fair amount of time in the U.S. Senate uh, testifying on in front of Senator DeGrasley's Judiciary Committee a few years ago. Husking, in some of your writing and speaking, you've talked about something called the illusion of choice. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the scary and sad thing where, so I'm, I'm from Iowa. Uh, I'm a badger, but kind of a Hawkeye too. But uh, I was walking around my co-op back home and now that I, so I tried to, I recreated this data set. I spent my fall finding these numbers, and now you see all these brand names of the company zone. And people, part of the reason why you created a co-op, but like go create an alternative system to these monopolies, to these multinational corporations. We walk around it now, you see Annie's, you see Tom's, they, they, the big boys co-opted the system. So what you're saying is that there are lots of different brands, but they're all owned by the same yeah. people and the profits are flowing in the same place. A scary example is, let's take Budweiser. So, you know, Budweiser is always- really scary. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh yeah, I know. Uh, so my dad used to sell Budweiser for a living, so I grew up in the beer distribution. So it's something I always follow and care about. So you know, they have all these craft breweries, but what they're also doing, and I forget what it's even called now, it's like in the, uh, but uh, <laughs> well, they keep buying each other and names change, but they're buying the craft beer ecosystem. Yeah. So the website ratemybeer.com, they own. So the FTC, I think part of their merger agreement is they can't buy a new craft beer. So all they do is say, oh, what's the next thing? Oh, we'll just make our own version. That's the problem with this power is you could try to do it, but in the day, these monopolies, and I, I'm trying to, uh, the organization I work for is our goal is to make the word monopoly cool again. And so it's, it's not just the board game? Not the board game. Yeah. So I actually would run around Iowa with the board game old enough being like, we gotta use this word more. Because we've been here before. You just, they're not evil anymore. They hire PR people. They're not standard oil where they're cutthroat. They have a communications teams that put on all these roses and all that cute Instagram stuff. But it's not. So, Austin, how? Why are you, you're clearly fired up about antitrust? Why? How did you get? How did you get excited about it? So this is like the nerdiest answer possible. Like I used to be a tax economist. Wow. Well, <laughs> I know. Tax <laughs> economists are sexy by comparison. <laughs> Honestly, if I want to get my mom off the phone and start talking about work. So like, but I was next door, this was 2015, 2016, next door to the White House and Treasury. On our computer screens was all the US corporate tax data, which from a nerd standpoint is really cool. You can kind of look at it, play with it, research. It was actually theirs where I discovered, I was looking at industries, and that's where I saw these super monopoly profits. But it's one thing to kind of see it in pharmaceuticals, it's another, it was a food. Food's honestly the one that kind of tipped my hat. I can't say, but there's one certain food company that essentially just makes corn products from uh, maybe some beverages and some like crackers. And you're like, how does this company have a monopoly profit? And so you're seeing that going on, and I fall into this hole of like, there's this, I'm part, there's this, there's a big battle going on in monopoly right now over how we define how we go after monopolies. And to me, this explains everything about this moment because I really do think we're living in a second gilded age caused by this monopoly power. Yeah. And Koch brothers are just robber barons who are trying to pro uh, protect their bottom line. And honestly, too, most of my family voted for Trump. Most of them still support Trump, and I get it. Because you're working more, more and more for less and less. He gives you an excuse to say you're okay to be angry. And these monopolies hollow out communities. It's, you have, I think the stat that really says a lot about this moment is, Five of the six richest counties in America are in the D.C. area. Let's talk about that conversation with voters and the, the general public and thinking about how does, 
how does antitrust come up in a political race? So Roger, you ran for statewide office in North Dakota and won election as the commissioner of agriculture. Did that, um, did monopolies and antitrust come up and did the conversation differ between rural and urban voters? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because the conversation, the way we're having it right now didn't, but a very close association of it did. In North Dakota, it's about corporate farming or anti-corporate farming. And North Dakota has a very strong anti-corporate farming statute on the books. It's illegal for corporations to own farmland uh, and farm in North Dakota. Uh, that was true for lots of other countries, or uh, country states, in, mostly in the Midwest. Uh, and over the years, a lot of those laws have sort of been watered down and in some cases eliminated. North Dakota is still on the book. Why is this an issue? Because I think the people really, really intuitively get the difference between a corporate farm and a family farm. And 99% of the people, only because it's something less than 100, would much prefer a family farm system in agriculture. And so in every race I ran, I ran four times, I won four races, in every single race, and I ran as a Democrat in a very Republican state. In every single race, corporate farming was one of the feature differences between me and my opponent. Did it differ in rural parts of the state versus urban? Well, this is North Dakota. There isn't really urban. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have Fargo, and we've got Bismarck, in Minot, in Grand Forks. So the four largest cities, and they're all like 50,000 or more. So they're really big. <laughs> I would find that in those cities, people more viscerally got this issue even than in rural America. And somebody said it earlier when they're talking about the generations where one or two or three generations removed. People still care. People still like farmers. They want to know where their food comes from. They feel a lot better if it's coming from a family farm than it's coming from a corporate farm. So uh, it's a it's very very close to this same issue. Uh, and I mention it because I think the politics of it are largely the same. Austin, how did the issue of antitrust play into your campaign for Congress. So yeah, I have, I ran 2018. Uh, we, we with, I withdrew before the primary. Roger won, I lost. I like to joke, I'm not even 30, I'm a failed politician. But um, I didn't even start till I was way over 30. You got lots of chances. I mean, I, I, I do think, to me, the beauty of this message, because it's can, when you start talking Monopoly right now, it gets really dark and really scared. But, Usually it's these dark moments usually when the big change happens within our country and I think we can use this coming Monopoly moment this trust busting moment to rethink our food system That's the hope here is that those numbers are not sustainable and they will a moment of reckoning will come um, for, As a campaign people love it. I mean honestly as a candidate the hard part is for me with learning the language When I'm in Des Moines the way I talk Monopoly is different with a suburban person and I have to learn that because no DC consultant can tell me this. You can't just pull people and go, Monopoly, how does it pull? And the current campaign model, if we're being honest, is about fundraising and TV ads. Because Google and Facebook are killing local news. So people have nationalized their news intake, so you have to, as a candidate, you have to run TV ads. And a lot of the money now is concentrated on the coast. So how do you convince a rich person in New York to you know, finance populism? And so a lot of it is, is you, in the day, you also can't be robber baron money. And so you accept that, and you work harder, and you do old-fashioned political theater. Like Robert LaFollette. I mean, I think it's so funny that so much great policy started here in this state, from Social Security, unemployment, but that was part of LaFollette. Um, and so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we're learning. I mean, the challenge here is 
I hope when you leave this room, you start talking about Monopoly more. And you're starting to see how actually in the, the caucus in Iowa. Warren, Warren's talking about it. Warren even had part of our tax plan had a Monopoly section. You had Senator Klobuchar talking about it. Senator Baldwin's been talking about it. It's just... What's fueling that? Because it's not like we're having less of a monopoly problem or that um, large corporations are, are having less of an influence on politics. But yet, at the same time, to the contrary, all the more. But this conversation is moving. Um, what's fueling that? So from my perspective, it's being fueled more outside of agriculture than inside agriculture. Uh, if you watch the national news, you know that uh, in the last year or two, for the first time ever, you had CEOs of the big social media companies called before Congress, Facebook, Google, uh, I don't know what all the other ones are because I'm too old, but uh, the, this, this question about personal data that these companies own and control and, and use to deliver your feeds and social media to determine what kind of news you see, uh, to see what kind of products are put in front of you, uh, that is, for people that are thinking about it, it's becoming really kind of scary. You know, it's really kind of Orwellian kind of stuff. And, and then I think if you look at what happened with the last election and sort of the influence of Russia uh, on our politics and breaking into these uh, websites of the, of the Democratic Party and all that kind of stuff, you just have all this, this news that's swirling around stuff that this isn't good. People just, they just get that this is not good that these enormous companies know so much and are able to control so much about all of us. So I think that's what's driving it. I'd be interested, uh, Austin, if you have a different perspective. I would just add on to it, they're just reckless. and kind of dumb. Like, <laughs> but Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg has 60% voting rights of that company. He controls, he has a monopoly on social media. He buys, here's the thing, if you wanna create a new company, what do you advertise on? Google and Facebook. They have teams that monitor the next thing. They will either kill you or buy you. And that's what he's done. And this man has never had a job before this. So what's dumb about that? <laughs> <laughs> Just the way he behaves in Congress. Just everything, he, he doesn't have a holistic, he doesn't see the value of journalism, doesn't, they want the money without the responsibility. And there will be a moment of reckoning with that. Also, this ideology, this Reagan, our whole monopoly framework is monopolies are okay because they lead to lower prices. Yep. Yes, let's talk a little bit about what happened during the Reagan administration. Well, so I don't want to talk about that one. I'm going to answer a question that you didn't ask yet, and I know it's on everyone else's mind, which is why does farmers union care about this? So a little bit of history, and then you can talk about Reagan. <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit about history. Those of you, you all took history and you all learned about the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act, and you know that Farmers Union really believes in that. So these are, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed, I think, in the late 1800s, 1890 or something like that. This was, when Austin talked about the earlier Gilded Age, that was the response to the Gilded Age. That was sort of robber barons running muck over, uh, over America and over our economic system. And Congress stood up and said, wait a minute, we've got to break up some of these trusts and we've got to have competitive markets, okay? So that passed in the late 1800s. And then there was a period of time when the administrations that were responsible for implementing that act, instead of holding the big uh, monopolists accountable, they kind of went after labor unions on the theory that labor unions are kind of monopolies 
of people. It's really a contorted sort of tip it on its head kind of thing. But that happened then for a number of years. In 1902, Farmers Union organized. That's when we were founded. So 12 years after the Sherman Antitrust Act. We were founded largely on this issue. We were founded because there was not competition in the marketplace, and we then uh, spread the, the, uh, the ministry of the value of cooperatives across this country, not because we somehow believe that we ought to have more work to do in organizing a co-op, but because we felt that cooperatives were going to be a check on these monopoly powers and that it would introduce competition into the marketplace. So, you know, in theory, uh, even if the even if the co-ops charge too much or they pay too little, at the end of the year, whatever that resulted, that that extra profit that ended up got sent back to the patrons. You know how it works. So that was the theory, that's why we were organized, and it had to be a really big problem, or you would not have seen an organization like this come out of basically the, the wreckage of earlier farm organization movements uh, on this single issue. About another dozen years passed before the Clayton Act was passed. And the Clayton Act did largely the same things as the Sherman Antitrust Act, except that what had happened is the Sherman Act had really not done what it was supposed to do. It had all the right sort of rationale behind it, but the way it was implemented uh, was, was it just wasn't doing what it needed to do. So Congress came back and said, we're gonna, we're gonna force this to happen. And it was Farmers Union that led the effort to make sure that we doubled down on this issue and passed another act that was much more prescriptive about how monopolies should, uh, should be regulated. Now, the last thing I'll say about this is ever since then, even though we've got great statutes on the books, they have been whittled away. And Austin knows a lot more about this than I do. I just know that they've been whittled away, and I'm hopeful that this is an issue that comes around in cycles, like every 100 years. Okay? <laughs> that was 100 years ago. It's time that we brought Congress back into this space and passed new law that sort of pushes back some of the judicial interpretations that have been wrong in many of the executive uh, interpretations. But you, you'd have a lot more color to that. I just want to add to your point, though, on once we kind of got that law down, a lot of the prosperity of post-World War II was rooted in this law, because it pushed power down from the top. And that's actually what the US did to Germany and Japan. We broke up all their industries, because that was antitrust was a big component of our post-World War II plans and also how those fascist countries came about. I would argue we're, we're in a very scary moment where Russia, China, they're, they're borderline fascist countries. And you can't, it's about pushing power down, empowering communities, because you, these robber parents, look, they just have funny money, I call it. And so, it's not that funny, because it's our money, but. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> I just think monopoly money. Oh, no. So, uh, but you asked the question about Reagan, yeah. and there was really sort of a turning point that happened, I think, in terms of, uh, of enforcement of antitrust laws and sort of a different attitude that came in was this sort of deregulation mania that really began there and it's sort of stayed with us for a long while. And a lot of us as individuals have sort of bought into this because government is, you know, it's not working, it's not doing the right things, it just puts out these onerous regulations and we have to pay the consequence. Uh, but really government has an enormously important role here they just need to regulate the right things. And they ought to be focusing on the big issues. But uh, this sort of, this change in how the federal government viewed this question, I think saw a pretty major switch for the worse uh, in, the, in the early 1980s. Can you guys remember Robert Bork from Nixon, Friday Night Massacre? 
That's the brave person of this current monopoly framework. By the way, he comes out of U Chicago, which was founded by Rockefeller. His, they, they changed this. They were judicial activists. They decided they re rethought the whole way we did monopoly, which was this this focus on price, just price. We don't care about anything else. And, and the terminology that we learned about at the antitrust forum in December was a shift from looking at the structure of markets to consumer welfare. Yes. So we used to ask questions like, "What's the CR for yep. if we approve yep. this merger?" But the link and then and now it's just, "Can we buy more cheap stuff at Walmart?" That's kind yeah. of the core of the standard. Well, it's like it's like classic econ thing where they over jargon something to shut you out. Yeah. Consumer welfare standard. What does that mean? It's like enhanced interrogation. Like, just say what it is. <laughs> and you have this whole industry in DC of these hired econ hacks who come up with fake numbers to say what you want. One economist in particular made $100 million doing this, this game. And the thing is, no one goes back and studies, first of all, you can't even find the numbers, which I think is funny, for a whole theory based on evidence. There, you can't find the evidence <laughs> to analyze. And then when you do, do you actually go back if you're a you know, researcher at Madison, you do your own research. Turns out when two companies sell 80% of the coffins in this country, prices went up. So it, it's just a wrong ideology. So you're having this battle of, do we use this? Do we fix this? No, scrap it. Go back to what we had that worked. Well, that seems to be one of the big debates in the antitrust community. Is, or do we lack, do we have good laws, they just need to be enforced well? Or do we need a new framework? Well, Austin, you seem to be saying, we need a new framework. Scrap it and, and I would just say look who finances the groups. That's the dirty secret of DC. Who finances people? I mean that's the thing is we're trying to our, a lot of our time is spent on Facebook, and Facebook hired Republican operatives to go after us. It's five of us. You know? Like you add all our salaries together, you probably equal one programmer on Facebook. But that's there's these whole complex of DC of all these think tanks. That are essentially just lackeys for robber barons. And so some of these groups that want to maintain it look at the funding sources, is all I say. So I think we need new legislation. And the reason I think we need new legislation isn't that the laws themselves are wrong, it's that they have been interpreted in such a screwy fashion. So this this consumer welfare standard is a perfect example of that. How that got interpreted into the legal system is it happened through all these supposed economics experts that came in and said, well, here's how we should measure these things instead of using these things that we have up on the screen. And so as a consequence, you have all the interpretive language around the laws that looks at a monopoly very differently. They look at, think about it to the end point, to it is the, if the consumer is in theory better off because you can buy something cheaper, then that's all that really matters. What well, doesn't it matter who made the product, and how it was made, and where it was made, what kind of a political system under which it was made, I mean, I think we all think those things are important. And so my point is that I think Congress needs to relook at this question and be very prescriptive about how we need to respond to monopoly power, and we ought to be breaking up companies. Yeah. How has, over, the, over your tenure at National Farmers Union, how has that conversation with members of Congress changed? One of the things that you said is, yeah. now it's on the radar screens of non-farmers. You know, we've been talking about this since the early 1900s. What else has changed about talking about antitrust in Washington, D.C.? Well, I think we really are on the early end of talking about it. So I've been in this job for 10 years. When I got to Washington, no one was talking about this, okay, in, in terms of of, of farm conversations. Yeah, there were there were little conversations about that that other slide I showed about all those seed companies that got sucked into just a small handful. Because some of them were still in the process of being, process of being sucked into 
uh, smaller numbers. Uh, but that now has manifested itself all across the country. And so I think there are, for the first time, you actually have serious members of Congress that are introducing legislation. Now, that legislation is not going to pass this next session of Congress. I have no illusions about, you know, this session of Congress is going to say, okay, here's a new definition of what it means uh, to, to have a competitive industry. But the fact that you've got bills that are introduced, the fact that you now have, well, you've got a member of the, of the, uh, of the House of Representatives, uh, Representative Pocan, who has introduced uh, legislation in the House, there might be a hearing on it because the Democrats now have a majority in the House. You start holding hearings on these issues and you start changing the public conversation around them, that's how you, be, and then the work that you do talking to members of Congress, putting pressure from the grassroots, helps them to pay attention and say, oh, if there's a hearing, I better be knowing what's going on. That's how you sort of build sort of the momentum uh, to pass a law or to change a law. Yeah. So do you remember Ida Turnbull? Am I saying that right? From She's the woman who did all the investigative work on Standard Oil. <laughs> She had all that research, and essentially, the number two standard oil just told her everything. And she really cared about oil because her dad was put out of business by Rockefeller. So she comes up with all these great stories, I think it was in Harper's, and shocked the name. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt was like, FTC, or go investigate. Did a two-year report that didn't uncover even more stuff. And then the company was eventually broken. This doesn't happen overnight, like Roger was saying. It's a slow ball. But in retrospect, it looks like it happened like that, but. It, it's, and I think you're seeing that with Facebook right now. So what role does the Open Markets Institute play in changing the public conversation? I mean, when you wake up in the morning, you know, Austin, what, do you, what is your goal for changing the conversation about antitrust, and how do you do that, and then what does that tell all of us about how we do it? Like the Pocan bill. The Pocan bill is actually an old Paul Wellstone bill. Um, a lot of it is, we do a lot of different things from writing to research to putting out the numbers, just interject the word monopoly into this conversation. And actually, can I tell you a little bit about the forum? Yeah. So we haven't made this public yet, but um, you heard it here first. Heard it here first. <laughs> uh, open Markets, Iowa Farmers Union, and Storm Lake Times. Storm Lake Times is a little town in northwest Iowa. Uh, we call it Steve King Country. Uh, it's a slaughterhouse town. It has two Tysons plant. There's a columnist in there named Art Cola. He won the Pulitzer Prize, I think two years ago, for all his editorials and research onto why water quality now is so bad. Anyways, he's gonna host, co-host, and moderate with us three a forum in the caucuses. Late March, we're calling it, it's like the Ideas Forum for America's Heartland. And it essentially is a, an antitrust forum. Um, we have a few candidates already committed, and we will soon be making that public, but it's, especially as, in this moment of declining prices, people, I like to say Trump always, Trump's always gonna blame the immigrant. I say let's blame Tyson's. So. so that's, it's all about just doing different things. You don't know what's gonna work, but you gotta keep fighting. One of the, uh, uh, one of the other famous awards that Art Cullum got the, the editor of the Storm Lake Times, is he got the National Farmers Union Milk Tackle Award yep. at our convention last year uh, for the work that he did in Iowa. And uh, if you have a chance to read his book, you really ought to read it. I carry it with me and read little bits and pieces of it as I fly around the country. Really, really impressive sort of grassroots hard shoe leather reporting that there's there's not a lot of left anymore in this country. Uh, and uh, just a great story. But I'm gonna add on to that. Wait, sorry, what? What's the name of the book? Storm Lake Times? Storm, I think it's called Storm Lake, just Storm Lake. Storm Lake. Uh, his paper, after he won the Pulitzer, declined in subscribers for six months. I mean, that's the state of journalism now. 
It's scary. It's a very scary time. Um, but art's great. He's a modern day Mark Twain. I, I get his paper. Actually, it's the only hard copy of paper I still get, and I love it. You know, it's you read the little thing. His his wit is incredible, but I feel like I know this talent enough. I never lived there. Uh, let's talk, let's stay on the topic of reading recommendations, Austin, oh. because I see a book sitting yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. So I highly encourage you guys to check out this book by Tim Wu. It's called The Curse of Bigness. 100 pages. And he purposely priced it at like $10, $12. This is the history of Monopoly in this country. And I didn't know until I read it, the Tea Party, the Boston Tea Party, was an anti-monopoly thing. Like, it, it's in our blood. And it's a really cool, it, it's, it, 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 Say what? They don't teach us that in school no, anymore. anymore. I had learned so much. You're not in school anymore. <laughs> yeah, but my kids used to be in school, and I was shocked when they weren't taught that. I used to, when I would talk about second, the Gilded Age, kids in high school would be like, what's that? So I, well, I have to be like, oh, the Great Gatsby movie. Even though it's not really the Gilded Age, all you're trying to get at is this moment of indulgence. The fact that someone last week in New York City spent $220 million on a house tells you everything about this moment. Talk more about what you have seen work in terms of getting members of Congress's attention or the, the attention of an elected official. Can you think of examples of issues that were not issues before that people care about now? We, uh, You're asking this question about a Congress that hasn't done anything for a long time. <laughs> your state, your state led, part of this monopoly thing, like going back to education, it's a muscle we have, we just gotta rediscover. It's like dusting off an old book. North Dakota has this great law about pharmacies, I just learned about, where like, the pharmacist, only a pharmacist can own the pharmacy? So that way Walgreens, the Walgreens in North Dakota doesn't have a pharmacy in it. It's all about thinking, how do you challenge power? Even something like procurement. Why not have all the schools in this, or even the military, all the movie theater and military in this country, make, it, make sure it's American made and grown. Doing that in your school district, maybe just thinking things that way, the power of procurement, the power of all this kind of stuff. It's just thinking that way, maybe even telling the Wisconsin legislator, collect this data. What is hospital con concentration in our state? You know, the, uh, we mentioned the Bohan legislation uh, earlier, and you heard that it was Paul Wellstone's legislation. It's also Cory Booker's legislation. So, Panion language uh, offered in the Senate, was offered last session as well, be offered, I don't know if he's introduced it yet this year uh, or not, but well. Uh, and again, this is legislation I, I don't expect to pass now, but it's, it's going to be offered again. Chances are it's going to have some, some noteworthy co-sponsors. Uh, that is progress in this game. Uh, you need to get folks talking about this and you need to get uh, public officials paying attention to this. I think this forum in Iowa is a it's a genius idea because at last count there were 20 some Democrats that were either announced or believed to be announcing to run for president against President Trump. That's a lot, okay? So you need to get as many of them as possible talking about this. No better place to start that conversation than Iowa because that's where the first conversation is. Uh, happen. And so, you know that if this becomes part of the storyline coming out of there, it has a chance of becoming a little piece of the storyline in this next election. The funny, thing, the, whole, the funny thing about that, Roger, is it actually this whole thing started as an idea over fried chicken. <laughs> Me and the president of Iowa Farmers Union, I was complaining about another farm organization in Iowa that's never opposed a merger, even though this organization is the voice of farmers. <laughs> and so we were frustrated about that. And so let's talk, like there's all these issues there, so we all know we need to talk about, let's talk about them. Our whole model of this forum is, remember when health, healthcare was one of the big things in 08? Because of a forum in La, uh, Las Vegas. A lot of the hotel workers put on a forum and John Edwards came out with his health care plan that forced Secretary Clinton and President Obama to do theirs. 
That's our goal here. So we'll have information in the coming days about tickets. We're still figuring that all out. But um, it's, it's gonna be fun. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta find the silver lining in this moment. Um, road trip to Iowa. Yeah. I think we're close to the end of our time, but I wanted to invite either of you to give any closing thoughts about this important issue and this important moment for dealing with consolidation and antitrust. Well, I want to change the subject in my closing comments, so you should probably go first on this. Um, tell everyone you know to start using the word monopoly again. That is so key. Because once you realize this illusion, you have the power in your hands. Point number two, I, not to plug my organization, but follow us. We're a tiny little thing, open markets. We're trying to do this, get you use that word again. We have a newsletter where here's our take on the news, but with a monopoly angle. We have an, an email called The Corner where we do that, and we have one called Food and Power where we look at food, um, the food industry. And that's where I got the beer thing from. One of my coworkers reported that Anheuser-Busch and Bev, their little venture thing was buying up ratemybeer.com. So it's a really cool way, it's our lens on the news. So I encourage you to sign up. Our website's like openmarkets.com or something like that. So uh, I've already told you that this is an issue that's really important to Farmers Union. I a lot of times say that this issue is a question that's in the DNA of Farmers Union members because it's so important to who we are and we need to keep talking about it. It's not unrelated to the Farm Bill. So this is my sort of gentle segue into talking about uh, what we hope to do this year with Congress. I hope all of you can come out to the National Convention in Bellevue, Washington, I know you're gonna be adopting policy here later today and tomorrow, and I know that you're gonna to work to get as much of that policy in the national policy as you can. This stuff is really important, and it is a part of why agriculture is in the crisis it's in today. It has a direct impact on your net income. A direct impact on your net income. And that is the biggest issue that's facing us uh, as an organization right now, is the farm bill that we just got passed in the lame duck session, is that gonna be sufficient to provide the safety net that we all need for the coming five years? I'll tell you that your national board of directors, Darren sits on it. We voted a little over a week ago Oh, Darren wasn't there. He was chasing off in Germany. You saw that earlier. So. But we, we voted a week ago, because Darren supported it before he left, that we were going to go back to Congress this year and try to get the safety net strengthened. Uh, I think this should be an important part of what comes out of the National Convention, but it'll only happen if that's something that that you all as members, as delegates to the convention are gonna be advocating for. I think we're in a stage of crisis uh, in agriculture today that we need to rise up and be much stronger in our voice and we need to ask Congress to do more. They have got to shore up this safety net while they work on these long-term problems. They gotta figure out a way to, to get us through this short-term, really, really difficult period that we're in right now. So that's, that's my final